Well, hello and welcome back. This uh, episode is following our series of some of the more famous chapters in the Bible. This one is Romans 8. So we're going to read the entire chapter of Romans 8. What does it talk about? What promises are found in Romans 8? Because just when I looked at it quickly, the first verse says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So the obvious question is, why were we condemned before, right? Why were, why is all this so important to God? You know, I've never understood so much. What are we so guilty of? So maybe this chapter is going to answer some of our questions. <laughs> so what promises are there? What teaching does it have for us? As always, let's learn together. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law couldn't do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the ordinance of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind of the flesh is hostile towards God, for it is not subject to God's law. Neither indeed can it be. Those who are in the flesh can't please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If it is so that the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if any man doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are children of God. For you didn't receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will be revealed toward us. For the creation waits with eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to vanity, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of decay into the liberty of the glory of the children of God. 
For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Not only so, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for that which he sees? But if we hope for that which we don't see, we wait for it with patience. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which can't be uttered. He who searches the hearts knows what is on the Spirit's mind, because he makes intercession for the saints, according to God. We know that all things work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called, according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Whom he predestined, those he also called. Whom he called, those he also justified. Whom he justified, those he also glorified. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how would he not also with him freely give us all things? Who could bring a charge against God's chosen ones? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. Yes, rather, who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Could oppression or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Even as it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. This came from Psalm 44, 22. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from God's love, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. May God add blessing on the reading of his word. So let's just see what we learned from Romans 8. Very interesting chapter to me, because we asked the first question from 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we were condemned before. God was, seems to be angry with us. But then it says, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Very interesting to me. So the whole point of Romans 8 is don't walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. And then it says, to the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So. And this made me free from the law of sin and death. So there's a law of spirit and life and a law of sin and death. Sin and death, living according to the flesh, leads to death. But then it says, for what the law couldn't do and that it was weak through the flesh. So the Jewish law, all those 500 laws they're supposed to follow, that couldn't get rid of our sin. Because we just couldn't do it. Another part of the Bible, it says simply that 
the law taught us what sin was. And then in verse 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Very interesting. I know another part of uh, scripture says that you're a, you know, you're a bondservant to whatever you put your mind on. The flesh, you're a bondservant to the flesh. The spirit, you're a bondservant to the spirit. And it says in verse 6, the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Very interesting. Though the flesh leads to death, spirit leads to life and peace. In verse 7, it says, the mind of the flesh is hostile towards God, for it is not subject to God's law. And in verse 8, those who are in the flesh can't please God. So no matter what we do, we can't please God. But if you're in the spirit, right, you're not in the flesh, you know, the spirit of God dwells in you. And if you don't have the spirit, you're not his. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is alive because of righteousness. So I've always wondered, what are we guilty of? Why is God so angry with us? Because we live to the flesh. We live to do what we want, not what God wants. But when you open yourself up to the spirit, then you can have life and you can have peace with God. And the result of all this, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. So what is God so angry about? Because we're living in the flesh. We're living for what we want. He wants to stop and live for the spirit. We'll start doing what God wants. That's going to be life and peace. Hope you learned something. Hope I learned something. <laughs> Let's keep learning together. Well, now for our new modern expression. This is the expression, letter of the law. And this is to follow the law exactly as it is written, without any regard to its spirit or intent. Sometimes you get this with children, but they said, you said this. And you're like, um, but that, that's not what I meant. So this comes from 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who also made us sufficient as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter of the law.